It's been said that the progress of human and social and political thought leads from Aristotle to Marx and thereafter is a further development of Marx or arguments and analysis that attempt to refute him. Whether or not you agree with that assessment, there is no question that Marx stands as a giant in the development of human thought and knowledge. He carried out a veritable revolution in the field of philosophy and together with his lifelong collaborator, Frederick Engels, was the originator of the materialist conception of history, which transformed that discipline. He was the author of Das Kapital, the 150th anniversary of which we commemorated last year, which provided an analysis of the laws of motion of capitalist economy, a feat never matched, rivaled, or even attempted since by the Bourgeois Academy for all its resources. And most important of all, he was the founder of the modern revolutionary socialist movement. For more than 150 years, his theories and scientific analysis have inspired and guided hundreds of millions of people in every corner of the globe as they have sought to storm the heavens, defying all odds and cleanse the world of every form of class oppression and inequality in order to enable humanity to raise itself to its full height, stretch its limbs and expand its mind to enjoy real and lasting freedom. Apart from Charles Darwin, the author of The Theory of Evolution, there is no other figure from the 19th century who exercises such influence in the modern day world. And there is a connection between them, because as Engels explained so well in his graveside speech on the death of Marx, just as Darwin discovered the law of development of organic nature, so Marx discovered the law of development of human history. The specific laws of development of capitalist society were laid bare by Marx in his masterwork, Capital. In the words of a reviewer of the first edition, cited by Marx as an exposition of his method, the book illuminated the special laws that regulate the origins, existence, development and death of this social system and its replacement by a higher one. Down through the years, the bourgeoisie and its ideologists have attempted in one way or another to refute the analysis of capital. But they've had the singular misfortune that just as they advance a theory which declares Marx dead and buried, some crisis in the capitalist system makes it all too clear that it is riven by the insoluble contradictions that he laid bare. And so here we are, having just passed through the 10th anniversary of one of the greatest financial meltdowns in history, if not the greatest. Many articles have been published in the bourgeois media by commentators on this event. But there is no one who is able to even suggest that this crisis, which plunged millions into poverty and whose social effects continue to deepen, has been resolved. Rather, they scan the horizon trying to find out where the next crisis will come from. Will it be from the acceleration of debt? the vast expanse of speculation, a crisis in emerging markets, a meltdown of the stock markets sparked by the growing upsurge of the working class, or some other, at this stage, unknown cause. The diseases of the profit system, which led to the crisis, have not been cured. Rather, they have metastasized and mutated into even more malignant forms. When capital was first published, it was generally ignored by the bourgeois academy. But as it became the theoretical foundation for the development of a socialist movement of the working class in the last quarter of the 19th century, that tactic could no longer be continued. Capital had to be refuted. And one of the most serious of those efforts, reflecting the general trend of bourgeois pressures at the end of the 19th century, came from within the socialist movement itself. In the late 1890s, Edward Bernstein, a leading figure of the German Social Democratic Party, a party which claimed to rest on Marxist foundations, proposed a wholesale revision 
of Marx's analysis. At its core, Bernstein's revisionism, perhaps more accurately described as outright repudiation of Marx, consisted of two interconnected components. First, that socialism would not come about through the seizure of political power by the working class in the revolution, as had previously been maintained, but would arrive through the gradual accumulation of reforms within the capitalist system, particularly those gains made by the trade unions. Second, that Marx's analysis that the contradictions of capitalism would produce an economic breakdown had been refuted by events. The development of vast corporations and banks, the expansion of the credit system at the end of the 19th century had made the storms and crises of Marx's day a thing of the past. Bernstein's perspective was decisively refuted by the outbreak of World War I. The contradictions of capitalism had not been overcome. They assumed a more violent and explosive form. Nothing like World War I had ever been seen before. As Trotsky wrote in a direct reference to Bernstein and the entire revisionist school, the war of 1914 is the most colossal breakdown in history of an economic system destroyed by its own inherent contradictions. Those contradictions were no longer theoretical postulates on the pages of Das Kapital, but re received material expression in the cold, the misery, the filth, disease, and the endless slaughter of the flower of the youth on the battlefields of Europe. If socialism could be considered to have been more advantageous in the 19th century, the World War fought at the beginning of the 20th for profits and markets in the interests of capital meant it had become a necessity in order to prevent human civilization being plunged into barbarism. If one were to summarize the efforts of bourgeois economy to refute Marx, they boil down to the following, that capitalism is not riven by fundamental and irresolvable contradictions. Now, the first attempt was based on Say's law, which prevailed until the 1930s depression made it untenable. It maintained that since every commodity seller was also a buyer, there could never be permanent overproduction and any problems that did arise were simply ones of disproportionality. This doctrine was replaced by Keynesianism after the 1930s depression disaster. It claimed that the problems of capitalism arose not from its inherent contradictions, but as Keynes put it, from muddled thinking, and they could only be resolved through judicious state intervention to ensure effective demand. History, however, delivered its verdict on Keynesianism with the end of the post-war boom in the mid-1970s, a consequence of the resurgence of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall a tendency which Marx had characterised as the most important law of political economy, above all from an historical point of view. The ending of, a bo of the boom was accompanied by a revolutionary upsurge of the working class, starting with the May-June 1968 events in France, and extending across a range of countries, shaking the political and economic structures of world capitalism to their foundations. However, the bourgeoisie was able to withstand the enormous economic and political upheavals of this period due to the betrayals of the working class by its Stalinist, social democratic and trade union leaderships. Having been able to cling to power, the bourgeoisie then launched an offensive against the working class marked politically by the coming to power of the Reagan presidency in, in the United States and the Thatcher government in Britain. A new ideology was advanced. The free market had to be placed front and centre. There was no alternative, in the words of Margaret Thatcher. It was not only a question of a new ideology. Capitalism underwent a major restructuring 
through the deployment of advanced computer-based and information technologies leading to what we now have come to designate as the globalisation of production. This was to have far-reaching consequences. It cut the ground from under the feet of all those parties and organisations, the Stalinist and Social Democratic parties, trade unions and so-called national liberation movements, which based themselves on a national program. And one of the most graphic expressions of this process came in 1989-91 with the liquidation of the Stalinist regimes in Eastern Europe and then the Soviet Union itself, regimes falsely labelled as Marxist. And the process, of course, was paralleled uh, in China. The crisis of the Maoist regime accelerated in this period. The liquidation of the USSR and the turn by the Chinese regime towards capitalism was met with an orgy of celebration by the bourgeoisie and its ideologists. From the political rostrum, in the media, in the universities, well-resourced think tanks, and even from the pulpit, they proclaimed that the demise of the USSR represented the final uh, proof of the superiority of the private ownership of the means of production and finance, that the so-called free market was the only viable, indeed the only historically possible form of socio-economic organisation, the conscious socialist planning of the economy was inherently impossible, and finally, and most importantly, that Marxism was forever dead and buried. Capitalism, freed from its historical nemesis in the form of the socialist revolution, was now going to bring economic advancement, democracy and peace to the peoples of the world. Well, history, the events of the past quarter century, continuous wars, the looming threat of a new world war, the exponential growth of social inequality, the development of ever more violent and authoritarian forms of rule, state and corporate organisation of censorship, the creation of millions of refugees, the return of concentration camps, the forcible separation of children from their parents, the escalation of police violence, the rise of extreme right-wing and outright fascist organisations. To cite just a few examples, history has cast its verdict on this claim. But even as the new doctrines of the bourgeoisie, based on the so-called efficient markets hypothesis, were being advanced, storm clouds were massing. A series of financial crises, starting with the global stock market crash of October 1987, got underway, culminating in 2008 with the most serious uh, breakdown since the Great Depression of the 1930s. So what's happened since then? Governments and central banks around the world, starting with the Obama administration and the US Federal Reserve, have pumped trillions of dollars into the financial system, handing over untold wealth to the very banks and finance houses whose activities led to the crisis in the first place, enabling still further speculation. Immediately after the crisis, the leaders of world capitalism gathered in London, April 2009, for a meeting of the G20 to pledge, hand on heart, that they would never again go down the road of the 1930s and impose the kind of tariff measures that played a key role in exacerbating the depression and creating the conditions for World War II. So today, where are we? At the beginning of a global trade war an economic war with military implications that intensifies every day as the US imposes tariffs left, right, centre against foes and supposed strategic allies alike. Every country with the US in the lead is building up its military forces in preparation for another world war and innumerable flashpoints for such a development have been created. The cost of the economic disaster has been borne by the working class all over the world in the form of stagnant and declining wages and cuts in social services spending. Exploitation has been uh, intensified along with the development of new forms of exploitation such as that used by Amazon. Hundreds of millions of young people the world over are being denied any future prospects. 
Now, one of the most frequently criticised conclusions reached by Marx has been his analysis that the inherent objective logic of the capitalist system, whatever its ups and downs at a given stage, the inherent objective logic of the capitalist system is the accumulation of wealth at one pole and the creation of poverty, misery and degradation at the other. What's the situation today? The policies developed in the US and followed to one degree or another around the world since 2008 have institutionalised a process in which the stock exchanges, financial markets, function as a mechanism for the transfer of wealth into the hands of the corporate and financial oligarchy and a tiny handful of people in the upper echelons of the income scale. That is, they operate like some giant financial vacuum cleaner. Now, this isn't an aberration. It's not a temporary phenomenon. It's an entrenched feature of economic life. At the same time, the claims of working people for improvements in their conditions, in health, education, social services, aged care, pensions, or the construction of public infrastructure are met with the response, there is no money. And that's true. But not because insufficient wealth is being produced, but because the wealth that is created by the labour, skills, ingenuity of billions of working people the world over, on a scale never before attained, is being funnelled into the hands of the ultra-wealthy. The actions of the financial oligarchy, its state and institutions, in creating this system, have to this point, so far, largely gone unopposed. Not because there's no hostility to what's taking place. There is seething anger. But because the struggle of the working class has been suppressed by all the parties of the political establishment, along with the trade unions, and with the collaboration of the pseudo-left, who maintain a class struggle, that's a thing of the past, it must now be replaced by identity politics focused on race, gender, sexual orientation, and so on. But this situation is changing. The year 2018 has seen a re resurgence of class struggle around the world. The working class is being radicalised by the conditions created by decaying capitalism. This movement must be fertilised and developed, that is, politically armed, with an understanding of the laws of capitalism uncovered and laid bare by Marx. How then to at least begin an understanding of Marx and above all his masterwork, Capital? Well, it will help this understanding by emphasising that while Marx provided a scientific analysis of the laws of capitalist development, he did not do so out of some academic interest. He worked, as Engels emphasised in the graveside speech, as a revolutionist, seeking to provide the working class with the theoretical weapons with which to carry out the overthrow of capitalism and end class oppression, opening the way for the development of a higher form of society in which the condition for the development of each individual would be the condition for the development of all. Capital, therefore, is not a book about economics as such, but centres on this struggle. While Marx strived for the highest development of science, Marx the scientist and Marx the revolutionist are inseparable. In fact, the enormous scientific breakthroughs made by Marx were only possible because he was a revolutionist with a critical attitude to bourgeois society based on the understanding that its economic categories were not natural and therefore eternal, as maintained by the bourgeois economists, but were the outcome of an historical development. Now, Marx, of course, didn't begin his intellectual and political life as a Marxist. So what was the path of his development? He began as a revolutionary democrat, concerned with the key political issue in his native Germany at the time. And this was how to bring Germany into the modern age. 
how to carry out the transformation of the country in line with the great changes that have been affected by the French Revolution of 1789 to 93. A key intellectual influence on his development was the philosophy of Hegel. Marx had begun his studies in the field of law, but philosophy rapidly became his central preoccupation. And this was because the questions of philosophy were bound up with the issues of politics and big political issues were on the order of the day. Those pushing for political change in Germany maintained that just as the natural sciences had been freed from religion, no one was shown the instruments of torture anymore as Galileo had been, just as the natural sciences had been freed from religion in order to become productive, so politics had to be freed from religion in order to become productive. Philosophy, that is reason, had to be made the basis of political organisation just as it had been made the basis of natural science. Now, according to Hegel, the state was the embodiment of reason. But there was a contradiction here. The enemy of reason, that is philosophy, was religion. But the Prussian state protected religion, maintaining that it was a state based on religion. It regarded philosophy and its appeal to reason as the enemy of religion and therefore the enemy of the state itself. The protection of religion by the state took concrete form in the issue of censorship. Marx's battle on this question began with his work first as a contributing journalist and very soon as editor on the Rheinische Zeitung, a, publish, a publication established by bourgeois liberals in favour of reform of the Prussian state in line with the developments in France. Now this was a very formative experience for Marx because in the course of opposing uh, the Rhenish parliament on the question of uh, theft of wood by peasants and uh, the uh, conditions of the Moselle wine, peasant wine producers, the state acted not according to reason but openly sided with the landowners. And as Marx was later to write, I found myself in the embarrassing position of having to discuss what is known as material interests. The bourgeois owners of the newspaper thought that by a more compliant editorial line, they would be able to avoid censorship. Marx completely rejected this. He withdrew from the public stage to undertake at the age of just 25, a critical re-examination of the philosophy of Hegel in order, as he put it later, to dispel the doubts assailing me, namely that the state was the embodiment of reason. That critical re-examination, centering on Hegel's treatment of the state in his philosophy of law, was to culminate in a revolution in human thought, the development of the materialist conception of history. Previous critics of Hegel maintained that his philosophy, which had provided a justification for the Prussian state in the name of reason, was the outcome of a conservative political outlook. Marx went deeper, showing that the problem lay at the very centre of Hegel's method itself, in which every development was seen as the outcome of human thought and reason. Consequently, the state was conceived of, as the outcome of reason and logic. In Hegel, the world was presented upside down, Marx showed. This inversion could be seen in his analysis of the state. Hegel maintained that it was the state which formed the organising and logical principle of what he called civil society, the family, commerce, the act daily activities of life. In fact, Marx explained, it was the other way around. The state arose out of civil society, the anatomy of which had to be sought in political economy. That is, a materialist analysis of society had to be undertaken. But this could not be a return to the materialist philosophy that had been developed by the French philosophes 
of the 18th century Enlightenment because they had been completely unable to answer the question of how society itself developed. The French materialists maintained that man was a product of his social environment, advancing the vitally important conception that both his vices and virtues were to be found there and not in some innate God-given qualities, least of all grace or original sin. If the environment could be changed, they argued, then man's virtues could be developed and his vices progressively eliminated. Changes in the social environment would bring about changes in consciousness. But how was the social environment to be changed? Well, it was altered by changes in public opinion, that is, social consciousness. But social consciousness, public opinion, was a product of the social environment. And so French materialism set up a contradiction, a conundrum. It couldn't resolve. It could only be solved through the discovery of an objective social process which did not depend on public opinion, but which determined both the social environment and social consciousness. The discovery of this social process was at the heart of the development of the materialist conception of history. Its essential foundations were laid out in the work which has come down to us as the German ideology, written in 1845, the critical reworking of philosophy undertaken by Marx and his now close collaborator, Frederick Engels, who had turned Marx to the study of political economy. In the German ideology, they wrote, it was necessary to start from real individuals in their activity, the material conditions in which they lived and the changes in those material conditions they brought about by their activity, above all, in production. Men can be distinguished from animals by consciousness, by religion, or anything else you like, Marx and Engels wrote. They themselves begin to distinguish themselves from animals as soon as they begin to produce their means of subsistence, a step which is conditioned by their physical organisation. By producing their means of subsistence, Men are indirectly producing their actual material life. The materialist conception of history is concisely summed up in the famous preface to the Critique of Political Economy written in 1859. In the social production of their existence, men inevitably enter into definite social relations which are independent of their will, namely relations of production appropriate to a given stage in the development of their material forces of production. At a certain stage of development, the material productive forces of society come into conflict with the existing relations of production, with the property relations within which they have operated hitherto. From forms of development of the productive forces, these relations turn into their fetters. Then begins an era of social revolution. Having elaborated the materialist conception of history, the task was now to apply it to capitalist economy, to discover its specific laws of development. But such an analysis, but an analysis of this, the most complex of all forms of socio-economic organisation, presented great theoretical challenges. They were concentrated in the question of where to begin? Should one start with technology and the development of the productive forces? Or population? Or breaking that down with the classes into which population is divided? Or perhaps with capital, maybe with money, start with finance and so on? It's not an easy question. Marx discovered the starting point in the work he conducted in a matter of a few months in 1857-58. He was driven back to work on political economy by the eruption of a major economic crisis which he believed would produce a new revolutionary upsurge 
after the defeat of the 1848 revolutions. In order to try to prepare this movement, he worked frantically, night and day, the results of which have come down to us in the form of the Gundrissa, the rough draft for capital. It's very much a voyage of discovery. The starting point of the Gundrissa is money. Marx subjects the analysis made by the Proudhonists in France to a detailed critique. The position of this trend, a form of petty bourgeois socialism based on artisans and small craftsmen, was that the exploitation of capitalism, as well as its crises, could be overcome through a reform of the monetary system while retaining commodity production, that is, production of goods for sale on the market. There was, however, a fatal flaw in this approach. Money was not some kind of technical device which had been invented and so could be replaced by another mechanism or a reformed monetary system. It arose out of the system of commodity production itself, which the Proudhonists proposed to retain. Therefore, to do away with the existing monetary system while retaining commodity production for the market would be like getting rid of the Pope without abolishing the Catholic Church. After dealing with money in the Grundrisse, Marx then examines the question of capital. And at the end of 880 pages in the Penguin version of this book, he comes to the following point. He says, The first category in which bourgeois wealth presents itself is that of the commodity, and is preceded by a note, this to be brought forward. A short sentence, but a turning point in human understanding. Accordingly, capital begins. The wealth of societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails appears as an immense accumulation of commodities. The individual commodity appears as its elementary form. Our investigation therefore begins with the analysis of the commodity. Marx then proceeds to show that the commodity is the unity of two determinations. It's first of all a use value, a thing which satisfies a material need, whether that need is connected to immediate consumption or further production. It's also a value which appears in the form of exchange value, that is, in the relationship of different use values one for another. Marx then proceeds to examine this appearance form, this relationship. And he makes the following decisive point fundamental to everything that follows. If I say, to use his example, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, that is 20 yards of linen exchanges for one coat, I am saying that these two different things are commensurable. They have the same quantity. But to have the same quantity, so to be able to be measured one against another, they must be qualitatively the same thing. So what is being equated in this relationship? 20 yards of linen equals one coat. What is the common quality they have? It can't have anything to do with their use values. They are entirely different things. The common quality is that they are products of human labour. And the measure of this general or abstract human labour is what determines the proportions in which they exchange. Each commodity has a value which is determined by the amount of socially necessary labour which went into its production. Why does Marx say socially necessary? Because it's clear, for example, that if it takes one hour to produce 20 yards of linen and on average one hour to produce one coat, then the two will be equal. But if an individual weaver takes two hours to produce 20 yards of linen, he will not receive two coats when he goes into the market. One hour of his concrete labour will not count as socially necessary abstract human labour. And moreover, he will not be told 
that one hour of his labour is socially unnecessary by any person. He will be told by a thing, by the relationship of his commodity to other commodities, things in the market. And here we see the origin of what Marx called the fetishism of commodities, which now assumes fantastic forms in the present day world, when millions of people are told by a movement in the financial markets, by a profit and loss account, by things that they must be thrown out of their livelihood. How then is value expressed or revealed? If I pick up the 20 yards of linen, I can twist it, turn it, tear it apart, subject it to chemical analysis, I will not find one atom of value within it. But it has a value, it's worth something. However, it can only show the value it contains when it enters into an exchange relation with another commodity, in this case the coat. And that exchange relation is determined by the quantity of value it contains. The coat then is the material representative of the value contained in the linen. The linen shows its value in the coat. But that's not sufficient. The linen must be able to express its value in relation to the whole world of commodities. Commodity production then itself generates the formation of a specific commodity, standing aside from all the others, which is the general material representative of the value of all commodities. That commodity is money. It's a material representative of the abstract human labour contained in all commodities, which is the substance of their value. Now, in his examination of the value form, something that had not even been attempted by Marx's classical bourgeois predecessors, Marx makes a decisive advance in his discovery of what he calls the dual character of labour, which he insisted was critical to an understanding of political economy. Let me just point to one reason why that's the case. We saw that Marx explains that the objective foundation of social revolution is the growing contradiction between the development of the productive forces of society and the social relations within which they have been advanced. So how is that contradiction expressed in the commodity the cell fall of capitalism. A development of the productive forces in linen production will bring about an increase in material use values. But the value of each yard of linen will have decreased because it contains less socially necessary labour. If you produce it faster, it takes less time. Thus, we have a contradictory movement. The development of the productive forces has increased material use values, but the value of each piece of linen has been reduced. Now we know that capitalist production is not production for increased material wealth, it's production aimed at expansion of value. So here we have the germs of this contradiction. Marx had already pointed to the expression of this contradiction in the Communist Manifesto. There he points out that in capitalist crises, an epidemic breaks out that in all earlier epochs would have seemed an absurdity, the ep epidemic of overproduction. Society is thrown back. Industry and commerce are destroyed. Why? Because there is too much industry, too much commerce, too much civilization, and millions are plunged into poverty, not because of a famine, or some other natural disaster, as in previous times, but because the productive forces have come into conflict with the, with the social relations within which they have developed. Having shown how money, as the general representative of value, arises out of the commodity form of production, Marx then develops the analysis of the interaction between money and commodities. From the standpoint of the commodity, this takes the form of commodity, Money, commodity. That is, the exchange of a commodity for money 
and then the purchase of another commodity with money, whereby the movement ends as a commodity that has been purchased drops out of the sphere of circulation as in consume, as, and is consumed. But viewed from the side of money, this movement is very different. Here, the form of circulation takes the form of money, commodity, money. The money at the end of the process does not drop out of circulation, but begins the process again. And here we have the genesis of capital as self-expanding value. Money, the material representative of value, is thrown back into circulation with the purchase of commodities. Commodities are then turned back into money, which then purchases commodities again. But in this circuit, money as capital expands in size. If there is no expansion, there's no point in beginning. The owner of money might just as well have kept it in his pocket. What then is the source of this expansion of money, of this expansion of value? How can additional value arise because in the sphere of circulation, equivalence exchange for equivalence? This is the problem which taxed the brains of Marx's predecessors. How was it possible? on the basis of the law of value in which equivalence exchange for equivalence for an expansion of value to take place. Now, it's no use trying to explain it by saying that robbery or theft takes place or that commodities sold by the capitalist to return to money is sold above its value. This is because in both cases, and they undoubtedly take place, the overall mass of value does not increase. It's merely been redistributed. If I take $10 out of Reed's pocket, well, he doesn't notice, I have expanded the value that I hold. But the total value in this room has not increased. It's just been redistributed. Yet the capitalist system as a whole is evidently characterised by an expansion of value. Now, this was the great stumbling block which Marx overcame. Money bags, he wrote, must be so lucky to find on the market a commodity which is itself the source of additional value. And that commodity is labour power, the commodity which the worker sells to the capitalist. Having purchased that commodity, the capitalist, like every other purchaser of a commodity in the market, is entitled to consume it. That's his right. The capitalist, having also purchased raw materials and other means of production, consumes labour power by setting the worker to work in the transformation of these raw materials and the means of production into other commodities that are then sold to realise more money. The raw materials and means of production pass on the value embodied in them to the final commodity. That is, their consumption does not increase overall value, but the consumption of the commodity labour power does. This is because the value of the commodity the worker sells to the capitalist, his or her labour power, not his labour, not his or her labour, their labour power, their capacity to work, is less than the value which is added by the worker in the course of the working day. The value of that commodity, labour power, is the value of the commodities needed to reproduce it. The value of the commodities needed to sustain the worker and the worker's family so that a new generation of wage workers can arise. These commodities, say, embody four hours of socially necessary labour. But the worker does not work just for four hours, but for eight or ten or more. The capitalist, like every other commodity owner, is entitled to the fruits of the use value of the commodity bought, labour power, and the use value of the commodity, labour power, realised in the process of production, realised in the process of its consumption, is additional or surplus value which it supplies. The epoch-making significance of this discovery made by Marx was rightly emphasised by Engels. Marx was by no means the first socialist, he explained. 
The socialism of earlier times trenchantly criticised capitalism and its consequences, but it couldn't explain them. It could only reject them as evil, as it denounced the exploitation of the working class. It could not grasp the nature of the process itself, and this was done by the, through the discovery of the secret of surplus value. With these two great discoveries, Engels continued, the materialist conception of history and the revelation of the secret of capitalist production through sur surplus value, socialism became a science. The next thing was to work out its details and relations. With the discovery of the secret of surplus value, Marx established that the working class, that class which sells its labour power to capital, is the sole social force within capital, capitalism whose historical task is to overthrow it and not some other social identity. He had verified a conclusion which he had previously drawn that the historical mission of the working class, the task to which it would be driven, arising from its objective position within the capitalist mode of production, was to overthrow it and the whole system of commodity production on which it was based was not simply an exploited class. Many people had seen that. It was a revolutionary class created by capitalism itself. As Marx put it in one of his early writings, it is not a question of what this or that proletarian, or even the whole proletariat at the moment regards as its aim. It is a question of what the proletariat is and what in accordance with this being, it will historically be compelled to do. Its aim and historical action is visibly and irrevocably foreshadowed in its life situation as in the whole organisation of bourgeois society today. As I noted at the outset, Marx's analysis was first ignored, but that attempt to confine him to oblivion couldn't be continued. His theory now had to be refuted, and insofar as that task was undertaken, it consisted in the claim that his procedure was unscientific and arbitrary in that in starting with the commodity and then examining the unfolding of the contradictions within it, he had simply developed his theory to achieve the result he desired. This assertion of an arbitrary beginning is a crucial component of all the attacks on Marx, not only by outright bourgeois opponents such as Bon by Werk, who was the first to advance it in the 1890s, but down to the present day. It's the central claim of David Harvey, for example, who has put himself forward as a guide to Marxist capital, both in his books and in his series of online lectures. Let's see what he writes. Marx's starting point is the concept of the commodity. He goes on, and it's crucial to understand that he is constructing an argument on the basis of an already determined conclusion. Now, if that were the case, then Marx's whole analysis would have to be thrown out on the grounds that it's completely unscientific. Marx, in fact, replied to such criticism in the last years of his life. He wrote, I do not proceed on the basis of concepts, hence also not from the value concept. What I proceed from is the simplest social form in which the product of labour in contemporary society manifests itself, and that is as commodity. Well, just let me try and deal with these two concepts. The product of human labour and its social form. It's very important. To elaborate on this point, a bushel of wheat produced by a slave has the same value as a bushel of wheat produced by a peasant, a peasant farmer. But these two products of labour arise in two different social forms. Every society is based on the expenditure of human labour. We don't survive a week without it, a day perhaps. But that expenditure of human labour takes place within definite social relations which evolve and develop. In the first case, the bushel of wheat is the product of the labour of a slave who is owned by his master. That's his social relationship. 
He has not produced a commodity that is a material thing destined for exchange. In the second case, the same thing has been produced but that thing, that product of labour, is embedded in an entirely different set of social relations, that is the market. So Marx's selection of the commodity as the starting point is not arbitrary, but thoroughly materialistic and scientific. Contained within the commodity, the simplest economic concretum of capitalist society, as he put it, contained within it is, so to speak, the DNA of this social order. You might ask, why have I focused on Marx's analysis of the commodity? The reason is that as the most basic form of all economic phenomena of capitalist society, it is accepted as natural and therefore eternal. And from this acceptance all the other economic categories arising from the commodity, profit, wages, money, interest, credit, are so regarded as natural and eternal. And if one has not scientifically probed the essential nature of the commodity, this cell of the capitalist economy as Marx did, then you cannot understand the most important phenomena of our times above all a recurring crisis of the profit system, much less grasp how to overcome them. We saw that the commodity is the unity of two opposed determinations, use value and exchange value, and that a growth in the productive forces giving rise to an expansion of use values could produce the opposite movement in value. How does this contradiction appear in fully developed capitalist society? The growth of the productive forces signifies that ever greater masses of raw materials, machinery and so on are transformed by ever smaller amounts of labour, giving rise to ever greater production of material wealth. But capitalism is not production of material wealth as such. It's driven by the extraction of surplus value. And here we have a contradiction because on the one hand, production is carried out with an ever smaller proportion of living labour, while on the other, Living labour is the sole source of surplus value and the basis of profit. And this contradiction expresses itself in the form of a persistent tendency for the rate of profit to fall and gives rise to recurring crises. The bourgeois economists seek to provide an explanation for them. This one was caused by insufficient demand, that one by the breakdown of Keynesian measures in the 1970s and so on. But they can never explain why crises recur. And their explanations are, quite frankly, becoming ever more bankrupt. In the last period, Mr Ben Bernanke, the chairman of the US Federal Reserve at the time of the 2008 meltdown, has told us that this collapse, marked by panic and lack of confidence, was caused by panic and lack of confidence. The crises of capitalism take different forms according to the historical circumstances in which they arise. But in essence, they are the eruption of the contradiction rooted in the very cell form of capitalism itself, the commodity between the growth of the productive forces and the social relations of the profit system. How can this contradiction be overcome? Not within the framework of the capitalist system, because all its efforts to do so, as history has demonstrated, only lead to the eruption of crises in an even more explosive form. It can only be overcome through the overthrow of capitalist social relations. Billions of people the world over want, desire a better world, free of all the horrors the profit system is unleashing upon them. But those desires, strivings remain but dreams unless there is a material social force within capitalism whose life interest stands opposed to this system of social relations. And that material force is the international working class. Now this conception is opposed by all the practitioners of identity politics and the theoreticians of postmodernism. But just conduct a thought experiment for the moment. Imagine that the dream of the practitioners of identity politics is fulfilled. 
that women, gays, people of colour, indigenous populations, transgender, occupy all the key positions of power and that all white males like me are excluded. This would not make one iota of difference to the operations of the laws of capitalism. But, but the critics are not silenced. The working class, as depicted by Marx, they say, no, it doesn't exist anymore. Of course, the concrete forms of labour undertaken by the working class have changed over the years in line with the development of the productive forces. They are not those of 150, 100 or even 30 years ago. But the social relations of capitalism based on commodity production and the buying and selling of labour power have remained the same from the time of the Industrial Revolution onwards. And when one hears the claim that the working class no longer exists, or has been reduced to a marginal existence, when one reads a book by a practitioner of pseudo-left politics with the title, Farewell to the Working Class, one sometimes says to oneself, are these people blind? The past three decades or so have witnessed one of the greatest changes in world history. The transformation of hundreds of millions of peasant producers in countries such as India and China and elsewhere into proletarians and the proletarianisation of what were once considered middle-class occupations in the advanced countries. The blindness to this process, however, is not the result of defective theoretical eyesight. It's the expression of a very definite class standpoint, the result of efforts by privileged layers in academia, the media and elsewhere to deflect the growing hostility to capitalism, above all among young people, away from the scientific analysis of Marxism and, the establish and its establishment of the revolutionary role of the working class into some form of identity politics. Closely connected with these positions is the denial of the necessity for a revolutionary party. Indeed, the common thread of all the various positions of the pseudo-left is that the building of such a party, above all as developed by Lenin, is some kind of original sin that leads inexorably to Stalinism. David Harvey, for example, even tries to invoke support from Marx in denying necessity for a revolutionary party. He writes, Communists, Marx and Engels have erred in their original conception laid out in the Communist Manifesto, have no political party. They simply constitute themselves at all times and in all places as those who understand the limits and destructive tendencies of the capitalist order as well as the innumerable ideological masks and false legitimations that capitalists and their apologists, particularly in the media, produce in order to perpetrate their singular class power. It will take more time than we have available here to detail all the instances where this is refuted. Let's merely note that 40 years after the publication of the Communist Manifesto, Engels wrote that the working class could only come to power through a revolution and that for the proletariat to be strong enough to win on the decisive day, it must, and this Marx and I have been arguing since 1847, form a separate party distinct from all others and opposed to them, a conscious class party. The forms taken by the Revolutionary Party have necessarily undergone a development since the days of Marx and Engels on the basis of the lessons drawn from the historical experiences of the international workers' movement. In particular, the most decisive development was that carried out by Lenin at the beginning of the 20th century. He insisted that a revolutionary party could only develop through a theoretical, political and organisational struggle within the workers' movement itself against opportunism, that is, against the constantly recurring pressure to undermine the struggle for the historical revolutionary interests of the working class in the interests of supposed short-term gains. Outlined in theoretical form in his 1902 pamphlet, What is to be Done?, Lenin's perspective was verified in practice. In 1917, the Bolshevik Party he had constructed, based on an intransigent struggle against opportunism, for which he had been denounced as a hair splitter, a dogmatist, a sectarian, carried out the first, and to this day the only, conquest of political power by the working class. What is that party today? 
It is the International Committee of the Fourth International, grounded on the vast historical experience of the past hundred years. The fight waged by Lenin against opportunism, the struggle against counter-revolutionary Stalinism by Leon Trotsky from 1923 onwards, culminating in the founding of the Fourth International in 1938, and then the fight waged by our movement, the International Committee of the Fourth International, since 1953, against all those tendencies which emerged from within the Trotskyist movement itself, which sought to downplay, remove, or emasculate its central perspective that the key task in the overthrow of the capitalist system was the resolution of the crisis of leadership of the working class. That task remains before us. But the objective historical conditions for its accomplishment have been created. First, the ever-deepening crisis of the capitalist mode of production, and second, the absolute bankruptcy and decay of the old organisations which held sway over the working class and which have played a central role in propping up the capitalist system. But here, one must recall another key point raised by Marx. History, he insisted, wages no battles. It fights no fights. It is real, live, active men and women who do that. And so on that basis, I urge you to join the International Committee of the Fourth International and carry out the revolutionary tasks revealed by the analysis and work of Karl Marx.